a path when you've got Como with Uba Como path. So, which makes sense. I mean, that's fine. So, you won't get it all at once, you'll get it spread out. So, we're going back to Paris. This is the Opera House. This is where Phantom of the Opera took place. And that's the, the roof where he would kind of hang out with the gargoyles up there. And this is the, um, this is where the monument to the Bastille is. So, you know, the Bastille Day celebrates the start of the French Revolution. And of course, you know, in Paris, there's a strike every day. I mean, so there was like a strike here. I can't remember what they were protesting, but if you just go there every day, there's a strike and somebody's protesting something. So it's a big protest there where the, you know, where the monument was. But, you know, interspersed with all that, of course, you've got, this is a shopping mall. So a little bit nicer than Fashion Place Mall. If you look, and so you look up at the ceiling, and they've got this gorgeous stained glass ceiling and all these levels here. So, you know, a bit upscale, a little bit, as I said, a little bit nicer than Fashion Place Mall. And this is what it looks like. Of course, you've got your obligatory Chanel ad in the center. But you can sit down in there, and you can get some, you know, tea or wine for like, you know, 30 euros. I mean, it's great. And here's the ceiling. So it's got this beautiful stained glass ceiling. So this is right down from where the, you know, where the obelisk is, where all the protests are. All right, so we're going to talk about the optic nerve. And so when you're looking at an optic nerve here, you, know, you guys all look at optic nerves every day. You can, it should have a sharp border. It should be flat. It should have a good color to it. Some people say pink, some say yellow. In any event, not white. And you look at the blood vessels coming out, you know, the veins and the arterioles, you should not have hemorrhages around here, you should not have elevation. So that's what a normal nerve should look like. All right, so we're seeing a nerve in a sagittal section. Chris, what stain is this? Uh, it's a trichrome stain. Trichrome stain. And so how can we tell it's a trichrome? It's three colors. <laughs> Very good. Can't put anything by you guys on a Tuesday morning. <laughs> So what do they stain? What are the two main things that they stain that lets you kind of discern things? Uh, that's a good question. All right, so what you want to remember, the two things that they, may, they stain, it stains connective tissue blue, and it stains what we call mesenchymal tissue red. And so if you look at an optic nerve, you know, you look back here, the sclera is blue, the optic nerve, you know, the sheath is blue, but the actual axons and fibers coming down here are red. And so when you look at the optic nerve, the axons come from the ganglion cells, they come through the lamina cribrosa, and then they form columns of axons right here. Uh, Mike, what happens to the axons as they're coming out through the lamina cribrosa posteriorly? What happens to them? They get myelinated. They get myelinated. So, they, uh, exactly. So, you know, the optic nerve head itself is about 500 microns, but by the time you go to the nerve, nerve behind with all the myelin and the sheath surrounded, it, it's about a, a 1.5, so it's 1,500 microns, so it's three times as big. And so you see this nice pattern here. Now, we're looking at the nerve in cross-section here. Marshall. What, uh, tell me what all these layers are as we're looking at the nerve here in cross-section. Um, you have the optic nerve sheet on the outside that okay. surrounds the entire nerve. Um, then you've got the, the peel and the rhactoid with the CSF in between and the rhactoid granulations. All right, so the way I like to look at this, my analogy I use is the fiber optic cable. So. Each axon becomes myelinated. So that's the little fiber optic itself, each little fiber wrapped with plastic around it. Then they form bundles of these axons with little pia around them. So that's the fiber optic bundles. And then the entire thing is wrapped in a pipe that's buried in the ground. And that's the optic nerve sheath. So the nerve sheath is continuous with the dura. And then you've got your arachnoid, subarachnoid space where CSF flows, your arachnoid granulations are here. And then the pia, the little pia septae surround the individual bundles of those axons as they're coming down. And then of course, 
What is this right here, Brad? Central retinal artery and central retinal vein. Exactly. So remember, they come through that central artery together. That's why you get arteriosclerosis causing central vein occlusions. All right, what are we looking at right here, close up here, Ariana? That is the trichrome stain with the axons in red and then the nerve tissue around the white and blue. So here's the sheath. Here's the arachnoid granulation, subarachnoid space. Look at the little PL septae. So those little PL septae send little fibers around the columns of axons. And here's the columns of axons running down. This is a cross section now. This is longitudinal. Now, um, Allie, in between these axons running along here, the cells are kind of in the periphery along where the PL septae are. What kind of cells live in the optic nerve here? There's Okay, ligrodendrocytes. Um, and uh, microglial cells. Okay. Um, astrocytes. astrocytes, exactly. So in these, in these little cell columns live astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and then there are little microglial cells, almost kind of like the Mueller cells of the CSF. And so little microglial cells live in there too. And then of course, here's the PL septae, and here's the myelinated axon bundles. All right, so you're a, you a student or? Oh, yeah. Okay, never mind, students don't get pimped. <laughs> but fellows do. All right, what are we looking at right here again? All right, so here's the central retinal artery. Here's the vein. Now, as you go further away from the optic nerve head, they get further apart. So remember that central retinal artery comes off the ophthalmic artery. It goes through the optic nerve, you know, a ways back, sometimes eight, 10 millimeters back, and then penetrates through and goes to the center. And so as you get further and further back, they get further and further apart. All right, what are we looking at right here, Sean? Okay. What do we call that kind of a nerve? Optic nerve hypoplasia. So is that a bilateral or unilateral condition? Okay. And and what does it cause in terms of vision? Yeah, pretty much nothing. It really doesn't do anything. Now, interestingly, this can run in families. And so I'm always curious, it's not common that you see these, but every once in a while, I'll see this in a younger person. And, and you know, if the mom or dad happens to be with them, I'll say, do you mind if I look at your eyes too? And sure enough, a lot of times it'll be there too. So you see that small optic nerve, this is the nerve right here. And then it almost looks like this little crescent of sclera showing through it because um, it's really small and hypoplastic. And so people have argued do hypoplastic nerves make you more at risk for AION or anything like that. It's not so much the size of the nerve head itself as maybe the size of the cup in the nerve. So if you whether that really causes anything. So optic nerve hypoplasia, not really a big pathologic condition. What are we seeing right here, Rachel? So what do we call that? Coloboma. What does coloboma come from? Yeah. From the Greek, of course, coloboma. So your mission, tell me what coloboma means. So somebody who's got a computer here, look it up. What does coloboma mean? Now look it up. What does coloboma mean? From the Greek. Let's see who gets it first. Coloboma meaning defect. Defect, very good. All right, so all I know. <laughs> are, are we recorded? <laughs> recorded. There was an attending who chose to call students this. 
<laughs> You're my little cold moment. You can guess who it was. I might be working. <laughs> I won't say anything because I don't want your grade to be affected. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. So coloboma. So interestingly, coloboma's in the eye. Let's go back to Chris. Where do they occur usually when you see colobomas? So they can occur in the iris or they can occur in the optic nerve, typically inferiorly. And so why do they occur there? Um, it has to do with development and it's where you have incomplete closure of the ophthalmic fissure. And so that's where they tend to completely close. Exactly. So remember all the way back that first lecture we did on the embryology of the eye, you know, the optic vesicle comes out from the neuroectoderm and then it invaginates. And as it invaginates, the vessels come up and what will happen is it starts to eventually form a circle and it fuses at the equator and then goes anteriorly and posteriorly. So when you get improper fusion of that, you get the coloboma. So the colobomas are usually posterior at the optic nerve or anteriorly at the iris. And they're usually inferior, maybe slightly nasally. But So you can see this is coloboma, the optic nerve head, inferiorly here. What is this? This looks like a very, very large coloboma um, so involving almost a whole quadrant. And what's the name given to a large optic nerve coloboma? Uh, morning glory. No. Morning glory. And so why do we call it a morning glory? Because morning glory is a plant that's got like a trumpet horn. And so if you think about it, when you go back, this is in focus anteriorly, but it's in, not in focus deeper because it literally goes away from you. So it's like you're looking down that flower and it's really just a large coloboma. I mean, kind of a coloboma vende, you know, if you're using the, the Starbucks analogy. So, you know, you have to do that in, in Starbucks because if you say small, medium, and large, people say, wait a minute, four bucks for a small cup of coffee? That's ludicrous. So they call small large, it's 1984 speak. And, Lar and medium becomes grande and large becomes vende. And so if you make it sound Latin, you can charge even more for it. So, so this is a grand, this is a vende, you know, optic nerve coloboma, so morning glory. All right, what are we looking at right here, Marshall? Um, so we see the optic nerve, there's what appears to be pallor temporally, and then there's a uh, central pit. Exactly, so you have an optic nerve pit here. Temporally. So what do we, this is what it looks like pathologically. I apologize, I had to copy this out of a book. I've just not, we don't usually enucleate eyes for this. And so you can see here's the optic nerve over here, nasally, it's pretty well developed and normal, but temporally here, you see this pit right here. There's no good optic nerve fibers. It dips in here and you see that there's CSF here and there's loose connective tissue. What's the biggest problem with optic nerve pits? Exactly. So this fluid, and I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of that. So it can actually course out, and it's thought to be CSF. And so it can actually course out underneath the retina temporally here, and then you can get edema under the, under the macula. Those are tough to treat, because what do you do? You can't laser that, because, you know, the laser's going to kill the fibers there. You can't really go in and put stitches in it. I mean, these are tough to treat, so you really don't know... It's hard to get rid of that fluid that's underneath there when you've got an optic nerve pit. <coughs> All right, Brad, what do we see in here? Looks like a lot of myelinated nerve fiber layer. Okay, is that a problem? Uh, generally not. Um, it should start at the lamina cribrosa, so I imagine you can get like an enlarged blind spot, but I don't think it really generally as issues. Exactly. So you don't you don't really get those axons that disrupted, but because you've got all that myelin sitting kind of above some of the fibers going through, you do get an enlarged blind spot, but you don't get arcuate defects or segmental defects. You get just an enlarged blind spot. I always tell people when I see this, because this is a curiosity, I always say you've got some extra insulation in the nerve fibers where it shouldn't be there. And the reason I tell them that is I say, you know what? If you may be, you know, in a car accident and have your head banged and somebody looks inside your eye in the ER, you know, they're going to start putting bolts in your head to relieve the pressure. So, you know, I'm telling you, you've got some extra insulation in there. It makes your optic nerve look funny. So if anybody's ever looking at your eye and suddenly gets really excited, let them know that 
you know, you just have a condition you were born with. So I, I tell them that it's extra insulation that shouldn't be there, and it just looks funny when you look in there. All right, what are we seeing right here, Ariana? There are all these little yellow bubbles that are Especially, we can see them kind of superior right there. What do we call those? Those are optinger drusen. And where does drusen come from? Mm -hmm. Almost. Actually, it's from the German. <laughs> I think it means just like bump or deposit or something. Well, you guys have your computers here. What does drusen mean? German, the word Druze, but with a umlaut thing on the U, and it says that the translation is gland. Interesting. I thought it was like bump or something. Mine, mine says weathered or uh, no, rock no. crystals. Node or bump or something. Okay, so in any event, it does come from the German. So see, Germans, there's uh, some words sneak in there. And it, by the way, that the Germans didn't take it from the Greeks, just the Romans, you know, so... So this, you know, drusen, you don't want to get confused because, I mean, there can be drusen in the macula, there can be drusen in the optic nerve, even though they're little bumps or deposits, they're completely different things. And so you can see on this one, the reason why you want to be cognizant of drusen is if these drusen are buried deeper, it will sometimes give the appearance of papilledema. Exactly. So you want to be very careful. So you see this disc at first glance could look edematous, but you see these little bumps on here. Um, Allie, what's a test you can do right there in the clinic to tell you whether there's buried drusen or not, if you're worried about that? Ultrasound. Ultrasound. And how do you do that ultrasound? Okay. Alright, you do a B scan, but what you want to do is, is what are these drusen made of? Calcium. Calcium. And so calcium really reflects that ultrasound light. So you can put that B scan on there, you find the optic nerve shadow and you'll see these bright white spots on there and then you just turn the gain down and the whole eye almost disappears but those little bright spots stay there. And so you can tell optic nerve juice. Now these are just varying appearances. This is pretty blatant, this one a little less so and so you can see a little bit more buried juice in there. And of course this is now, I mean this is an autopsy eye but there's, there's definitely lots of juice in there. And so you can see that it, Barry Drusen and papilledema, the difference is really tough to tell. So that's where your ultrasound is really helpful, where you know you're going to be really excited about this patient or you're not going to be excited at all. And so you can do that right in the clinic with the B-scan. And when you look at these, another test you can do, you can actually do a CT scan because you see that the Drusen just light up here on a CT scan also. So the calcium makes them light up right away at the optic nerve head. And this is pathology. Now, this is a gross specimen, and you see that they are anterior to the lamina cribrosa. So the deposits are, are kind of on the inside surface. of the, Here's the lamina cribrosa. Here's a calcified druse. Oh boy, it's druse singular. I don't know. I don't know my German grammar. Singular. It says Drew is singular. Oh, yeah. yeah, so it's probably singular. Here you see, here's the lamina cribrosa, here's the optic nerve head, there's that calcium right there. So there's a calcified optic nerve head drusen. And now those can disrupt the little fibers coming in there. So you can get some, some nerve fiber layer defects that are arcuate when these drusen come in. The problem is, again, you can't really um, treat these a whole lot. Not a whole lot you can do about them. Here's another one right here, and more down here. So it's calcified. All right, what are we looking at back? What are we looking at here now? Okay. So you see that that margin is fuzzy here. You don't have a distinct margin. Of course, if you're looking at with a 90, you would see that that was coming out towards you. That would be elevated. So what would your concern here be? Okay, edema. So 
It's good that you said that because you got to be really careful. They'll, they'll gotcha you on boards. So papilledema, what is the definition of papilledema? <clears throat> Exactly. So that's really important to remember that. So not all swollen nerves are caused by papilledema. You can have unilateral swollen nerves. And so they'll often show you these on like oral boards as a gotcha. And if you say papilledema, they go, hmm, tell me more. And so remember, papilledema is bilateral, so you can't tell that on a single picture. And it's by definition due to <coughs> increased cerebral spinal fluid pressure. So when you say this, when you see it just a single one, you say that is optic, that's a swollen optic nerve. And then if they say what could cause this, well, if it's bilateral and has increased CSI pressure, it could be papilledema. <coughs> and you get extra brownie points, you know, on your, on your oral board. So be really careful how you define that. And here you can see, hopefully, even a student would not miss this. And so as you look in, there's that markedly edematous elevated nerve. Look, there's flame hemorrhages on it here. There's congestion of the vessels coming through here. So this is, you know, grade four, grade five, depending on what scale you use to grade optic nerve edema. This is the ultimate grade of edema. And we look at it right here. Here's the lamina cribrosa. And you look, here's a swollen, elevated optic nerve head. The vessels are dilated, but look, there's even hemorrhages here on the head. So that's, that's papilledema. Here you can actually see the fibers of the lamina cribrosa bowing forward. It's a definite forward bowing. This is a little bit more subtle. Did I, did I ask you something yet, Sean, on this? Okay, Sean, what could this be? Uh, All right, so you could get, you know, blurred margin if you have acute ischemia. So that could do it. What else could give you a blurred margin if it's really acute? Exactly. So even like an optic neuritis type process. And so you know, your differential of a you know, kind of swollen, irregular nerve here. I mean, you, know, you want to look at it broad categories again. You don't want to just jump right in and say something. So again, if you're on a board, you say, well, it could be ischemic early on. It could be inflammatory. And then in that inflammatory, you'd say, okay, demyelinating diseases, things like that. And so it's got a fairly broad differential depending on what the vision is and depending on you know, what the history is and other factors that you look at. And so why would I be showing you this structure? Rachel, what the heck is this? Uh, why would I show you this at this point? Exactly. So when you see a disc like this, one of the things that you don't want to miss is, you know, you could say, all right, could this be ischemic? And so, of course, you can have your run-of-the-mill, we call it AION, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. You know, classic history is what? And when does, he, when does this tend to happen? When do they notice this most often? Exactly. So remember, your blood pressure tends to get pretty low really early in the morning. And so again, it's a vascular path, more male than female, because the, you know males tend to smoke and eat more you know, cheeseburgers and all. And so although women are catching up now, women smoke just as much as men now. So they're, they're slowly catching up. But, so it's a vascular path. And oftentimes it'll be unilateral, it'll occur first thing in the morning, but you do not want to miss what Rachel said, which is giant cell arteritis. And so you do temporal artery biopsy. Chris, is this positive? No, this is a negative sample. Yeah, so something we see all the time in the lab. This is a nice, you know, pretty good looking artery. There's the lumen, there's the intima, little bit of intimal thickening. What layer is this right here? 
Internal elastic lamina. So how do we describe that? Uh, it's really that it's intact. Um, it's well defined. It's how do I? What do I use to say what it looks like? Oh, you guys have been out of path. That's right. So this looks like the Mississippi River. You know, when they show you those satellite pictures, when there's all the floods in the Midwest, it curls back and forth. I guess the other thing you could look at is like you know the old because this occurs in old man, you know, old man's pajamas. You know, with the little elastic on there. So internal elastic lamina. What layer is this? Muscular. Muscular media, and then here, adventitia. All right. What do we see in here, Mike? Definitely a negative old man PJ sign. Okay. Um, don't see much of an internal elastic lamina, and then the muscular media is just real. Yeah, you look at that, where well, that lumen is narrowed, look how thick that intim is. Where the heck is the internal elastic lamina? Should be right there, it's gone. Where's the muscular media? Should be right there, it's gone. All right, what are we showing here? So what's another word people use on this condition? Uh, giant cell arteritis. Exactly. So we call it temporal arteritis, giant cell arteritis. And so you can get a non-arteritic AION, but what you do not want to miss is an arteritic AION. And so if you are at all suspicious <coughs> and you, you see a patient in there in the clinic and you do the lab tests and sure enough, the SED rate's high and the... Um, what else? What's another test we do besides the SED rate? CRP, elevated exactly. platelets. Exactly. Yeah. So CRP is high, SED rate's high. So you're very suspicious. What do you do immediately? Start steroids. Start steroids right away, okay? Marshall, you start the steroids right away, then you want to schedule them for biopsy to make sure you've got the diagnosis. How soon do you need to do that biopsy? Seven to ten days. Exactly. So that's really important because sometimes people, now this is the, the, the thing that really bothers us here at a, at a referral center. Outside doc will see these guys and say, well, I think it's temporal arteritis. Let's give them 40 of prednisone. Is that a good treatment? Uh, no, it's too yeah. low of a dose. So it's too low of a dose, but not only that, you don't have a diagnosis. So what happens when the patient gets crazy from the prednisone or they get aseptic necrosis or bleeding ulcers or the diabetes is out of control? You say, well, do they really need to be on this? You don't know. So seven to 10 days later, that biopsy becomes negative. And then we play a game. We say, is this healed arteritis? Was there arteritis there? So you've got to have a diagnosis. Very, very critical. And so, but you can do it within seven to 10 days. As long as you do it, the, the biopsy will still be positive. But don't wait, because they could lose their other eye in the interim. And so do the biopsy, and of course, this, you know, you've got to have the diagnosis. If they do run into troubles with steroids, you need to know do they really need them or not. And this is, is an entity that I just said, what the heck is this, Brad? Do you see any inflammatory cells or giant cells on there? On low power, it doesn't look like it. Yeah. It doesn't look healthy either. Yeah, so where's the internal elastic lamina? It's not there. It's not there. Muscular media, a little bit here. Boy, look at that right here. Completely gone there. So what do we call this entity? We just said it, short-term memory. GCA. Well, beyond <laughs> that. Uh... <coughs> this is healed arteritis, oh. we call it. So, this is after a patient's been on steroids for a long time, and then you do the biopsy. So sometimes it's blatant like this. You look at that and you say, okay, that's, that's healed arteritis. This patient definitely had arteritis, but sometimes it's more subtle than that. You see a little disruption of the internal elastic <coughs> lamina, get some areas of muscular media thinning, but you can get that even in severe arterial sclerosis. So you wanna make that diagnosis at first, but this is one that we could also make a diagnosis. This is called healed arteritis. All right, what do we see in here? Yeah. This nerve was failed. Okay. Um, the edema induced the picture, but... Kind of, maybe a little pale, but look, maybe even a little bit fuzzy <laughs> there. So you've got one of these... Maybe. 
this could be an, an old GCA, but what if this patient were 20? Okay. Then, uh, then we can think of um, the atrophic etiologies, like uh, the bloopers can be calcined, or can lead to myelinating or something like that. Okay, so you know this, the saying that is the classic saying. Okay, if you hear hoofbeats, you you look for horses. You don't look for zebras. Okay, so what would be the horses here? Uh, demyelinating. demyelinating. So your concern would be possibly demyelinating disease here. You know, history's you know different. They're younger now. That you know, they may have have some you know some visual loss here, some pain on movement. Why is it really important to make a diagnosis of, you know, if, if you've got demyelinating disease? Exactly. So you really want to look for MS. And then, you know, when you treat these, it's interesting. I'm sure that the neuro-ophthalmology people pound this into you, the studies they've shown about using IV steroids as opposed to oral steroids, high dose, and then a rapid taper. And that really does bring back their vision quicker. So <coughs> if you use IV steroids and you pound them and then you narrow and then you, you slowly taper it down, six months later, um, what's the visual outcome compared to if you didn't do steroids? No, exactly the same. So look that up real quick. Now you will get an acute recovery and they'll recover vision much quicker. And they may not get MS or certainly delay MS, but when you look at their actual vision six to 12 months later, it's about the same. And so what happens is, is eventually, even if you don't treat um, demyelinating disease, it gets better. All right, let me just show you one here. Okay, so this is what it looks like when you have, a, a, say, a person who's got MS or optic neuritis. You'll often get a focal area of demyelination. So it doesn't demyelinate the whole nerve, but you get a focal area here in the cross section. And see, that's demyelinated. And here's a longitudinal view. Here's the normal artery here, right in here. Again, you get some focal demyelination. So it's important that you look for MS. If you do treat them with steroids, believe it or not, you can actually delay the onset of MS. And up to even a couple of years, it's unclear whether you can prevent it, but you certainly delay it, and that's important. So it's real critical to treat these guys early, but interestingly enough, they recover vision about the same after six to 12 months, whether you do the steroids or not. Now, this just shows you what? Allie, what are we looking at here? Look at how wide that subarachnoid space is. What does that indicate? Mm -hmm. Atrophy or massive mass of the optic nerve. Exactly. So this is kind of an end stage. This doesn't tell you what happened. This just tells you that something disrupted it, being ischemic, being a demyelination, whatever. Now that nerve is atrophied. You get widening of the subarachnoid space. So if you have an insult to the optic nerve, how long does it take for that nerve to get pale? Yeah, months. And so if you look in there, you say, oh, that nerve looks pretty good. That, that, you know, it takes a while for those axons to die off enough that that nerve gets pale. And so you can have an insult and the nerve looks pretty good. And then it can take weeks to even a few months for that nerve to finally turn pale and, and atrophy. And again, this is end stage. It doesn't tell you what happened. What are we looking at right here? So look at the red, look at the, the central light reflex. That's in the center, that's a little bit superior. So it's almost like that eye is down a little bit. But look how full that nerve crease is there. There's not only ptosis, but you get the idea that that eye is 
coming towards you, it's coming out more, what would your concern be there? Okay, so first of all, how old's the patient? Yeah, young patient. So what would you worry about if you had some sort of mass pushing the eye out and down in a young person? All right, so the most common tumor of the optic nerve in a young person is an optic nerve glioma. What are these we're seeing right here? All right, so what are, what are stria of the, of the retina mean? Okay, and again, that's what I was taught. I said, boy, you see stria, man, you better worry. There's like a tumor in the muscle cone or a tumor of the optic nerve or something. And now as people have studied this, what do they find the most common cause is? Uh, opposite. Hyperopia, yeah. So it's kind of a short, flat eye. And, and so interesting, we used to get, we said, oh my God, this is a tumor, this is terrible. And then people have actually studied these and they looked and they said the most common cause of this is kind of a small myopic eye with a flat posterior surface. And so that's most common. But again, the other things you said, a tumor within the muscle cone, including the optic nerve, could do this too. So you worry about that. And sometimes this is the end result if you don't treat these. What's going on here, Rachel? Yeah, so this is as pale as it gets. I mean, that's a white, white pale optic nerve. All right, we're showing a scan right here. What are we seeing right here? This is the screen of the portal mass um, on the uh, left eye. No, this is the screen. All right, so you see that it's kind of, we call it fusiform. And if you look carefully at it, it's like that mass involves the whole nerve. It's not a mass around the nerve. It's a mass in the nerve, involving the nerve. And this is what it looks like when you take it off. Here's the optic nerve. Look, here's the sheath here. This thing is actually intrinsic to the optic nerve. And so we said the word optic nerve glioma. What's another term we use for these lesions? Uh, astrocytoma. So which grade? Uh, typically, these would be low grade, so grade one. Yeah, so you know, astrocytomas, remember they grade them one through four, one being you know, most optic nerve gliomas, 4B in the really severe um, <coughs> glioblastoma multiforme that forms in the brain. And so these are often grade <coughs> one, low grade. And, and the other thing, sometimes people call these juvenile pilocytic astrocytomas. And this is what it looks like. Kind of this fusiform enlargement of the nerve itself with the sheath over it. So this is why they call it, you know, pilocytic. Pilocytic means hair-like. And so they'll have these little spindly-shaped, low-grade astrocytes in here. Mike, what are these eosinophilic staining inclusions here? The, the, uh, Rosenthal fibers. Rosenthal fibers. So you get these little eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusions here. And again, they're really classic to uh, low-grade glioma, optic nerve glioma, so Rosenthal fibers, and there's a close-up of one of these, these kind of eosinophilic deposits that are here, and these are called Rosenthal fibers. Now, right here, I'm showing you something. Here's part of a normal nerve. Here's the tumor arising here, so you can see that it doesn't necessarily take up the whole nerve yet, but it's arising there. But one thing you worry about with these, Marshall, what am I showing you right here? What the heck is that? Samoa bodies. Well, yep, yeah, exactly. It kind of looks like Samoa bodies. And so what, what does this signify? Exactly. So you want to be really careful. Sometimes people say, well, we're not sure this is an optic glioma. We're going to do a little superficial <coughs> biopsy. And so whenever you have a big glioma growing into the nerve, you can get reactive proliferation of the meninges. And so if you do a superficial biopsy, people are going to say, oh my God, that's a meningioma right there. And that's not. That's actually a reactive proliferation of the meninges with an underlying optic nerve glioma. So if you do a biopsy, you want to be really careful. And because the reason why you want to be really careful is what if you do have a meningioma in a kid? 
Is that bad? Um, yes. It could continue to grow. Well, so, so what I want you to remember, that what, what you want to remember here is if you have an optic nerve tumor that's outside the normal group that you see it in, it usually means it's worse. And so you see gliomas most commonly in kids. You don't usually see them in adults. If you see a glioma in an adult, that's really rare and that could be really aggressive. On the flip side, you see gliomas in kids. You don't usually see meningiomas in kids. So if you see a true meningioma in a kid, that's really an aggressive rare tumor. And so if you're gonna do a superficial biopsy, make sure you get some nerve with it, not just meninges, because you could make a misdiagnosis and that can have real ramifications on the treatment. What do we see in here, Brad? Uh, it's an external photograph. Uh, the right eye we can see is uh, very proptotic with what looks to be like some subconscious hemorrhage temporally. Um, really just like a lot of fullness around the orbit with some, um, some edema, periorbital edema inferiorly and superiorly. Okay, so you want to do a, you want to do a look. What do we see in here? So these are, um, uh, it's an optic nerve with optociliary shunt vessels. What's that indicative of? Um, pressure, increased pressure. And not only increased pressure, but slowly increased pressure. So if you surround the nerve with something and slowly squeeze it down and it gets progressively blockage of the blood drain and, and ischemia, you can get these little shunt vessels formed. Now these can form even in a central retinal vein occlusion. You can get those too, but if you have something that's slowly, surely squeezing that nerve in a long period of time, you can get these optociliary shunts, and what kind of tumor does that? Uh, like a meningioma. Meningioma, <laughs> exactly. So here's a um, scan of a meningioma. What is the classic sign that you see here of an optic nerve meningioma? Tram track. Tram track sign. So, you know, you go up to Snowbird, you know, you've got the tram, you've got the central thing holding on to the your car that you're in, and then you've got the two wires next to it. And so what this is indicative of is you see the nerve is in the center <coughs> and the tumor is around the nerve. So when you do that um, cross section or sagittal section there, you can see that it's got, sometimes there'll be two, one on each side. So that's the classic tram track sign. That's a sign of something growing around the nerve, not intrinsic to the nerve. And that's usually what you see in a meningioma. Now, this is a severe meningioma. I mean, this patient actually had an exenteration here. And so you see this tumor can be huge. It's pretty uncommon that it gets that big, but it can be pretty huge. And what is the characterize the, the cells that you see here? So we say meningioma, what kind of cells proliferate in a meningioma? Actually, they're the meningothelial cells. The little cells that form the arachnoid granulations, we call them meningothelial cells. If you look at them, they almost look like squamous cells on the skin or the conge. So they've kind of got this central nucleus, this rounder, pale staining cytoplasm. And here you can see them. These almost look like a sheet of squamous cells when you really look at them. So these are the meningothelial cells that proliferate. What is this thing? It's a MoMA body. Spell it. M-O-M-A. Exactly. So there's a double M in there. So somoma bodies. What are they made of? So they've got calcium, they've got some collagen in them, they're these lamellar concretions that are there. So these little round things, they're called somoma bodies. And these are classic for optic nerve meningiomas. So somoma bodies is what you see classically. All right, we've got something else going on here. Allie, what do we see in here? Looks like there's another mass. It's intercoronal. <clears throat> Kind of hard to say where it's. 
Now, so it could be coming from the nerve, or if you really look, maybe even next to the nerve. So what else lives in that intracoronal space that can give you a round, slowly growing <coughs> lesion? The schwannoma. The schwannoma, exactly. And what are the, the two <coughs> classic ways we describe schwannomas? All right, so what is this one? Exactly. So you see that swirling fascicular. It almost looks like, you know, that you see, you know, in Jacques Cousteau's down in the ocean on the Calypso, and you see the little schools of fish swimming together. They kind of look like this. So you get this kind of schools of fish swimming. This is the Antony A, or fascicular pattern. And then you can have kind of a mixoid pattern where you've got individual cells and then a lot of this connective tissue. It's got some you know, some fluid in there, and it's got some material, connective tissue material in there. So this is called the Antony <coughs> B pattern. So these are, these are what we call schwannomas, or what's the official word that we describe them? Neurilimomas, another thing that you want to know how to spell, neurilimomas, or schwannomas. All right, so Antony A, Antony B, you want to remember those are the two different patterns that can occur with these. All right, and again, there's the obelisk that everybody gathers around when they do protests. So again, there's protests here every day. So next week we do orbit. <coughs> we up on orbit. We're going to talk about orbit. And then we actually finish first week of March with tumors. And then we'll do a review before. OCAPs are what? Third week of March? So I think we do an OCAP review that second Tuesday of March also. Questions on optic nerves in five minutes. <laughs>